for so long, we were taught to think about the relationship between Britain and its former empires in terms of a kind of one-way road of development. You know, this idea that, you know, places like Nigeria or like India or like Ghana or like Kenya, um, you know, in those countries you might see huge inequality between the very wealthy and the everyday people. You might see, um, you know, political instability. You might see, um, you know, economic insecurity. But this is all part of the growing pains of these young colonies and eventually you know, if they, you know, listen to the lessons that were left by the motherland and, you know, apply a kind of uh, a strict fiscal policy and, you know, listen to the IMF, you know, say their prayers and eat their vegetables, eventually they would have, um, you know, a kind of uh, a, a more egalitarian society that, you know, was so um, common in terms of the European social democracy model in, in the kind of mid to late 20th century. And what I'm arguing in terms of the boomerang idea is that I think we're very much seeing the reverse of that. We're actually seeing a lot of the policies that were fired out in the colonies and particularly in the colonies after independence. And so in that moment when all of a sudden there were these governments across all these former territories where companies used to operate without having to worry about the democratic um, force of the local population and now had to wrestle with well, what happens if this particular government expropriates resources, what happens if this particular government increases the tax rate. The counter response to decolonization was sometimes quite crude, like a coup d'etat in Iran, but then eventually becomes more sophisticated in terms of structural adjustment programs, in terms of odious debt, um, in terms of conditional loan agreements, in terms of the offshoring of wealth. And these tactics essentially to protect the movement of assets around the world from the threat of decolonization is for me starting to have an impact right here in the former heart of the biggest empire the world has ever seen. And this is what I mean by the boomerang. The structural adjustment programs that you would have saw in the global south and the former colonies in the 1980s and 1990s start to look a very, you know, start to look a lot like austerity policies that are now being implemented right here in the United Kingdom. You know, the offshoring of wealth used to be a problem for these former colonies in the global south, you know, capital flight. Now it's something that we're wrestling with and struggling with right here in the United Kingdom. Kojo Karam, hello. How are you? Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah. Before we get into Uncommon Wealth, the mm -hmm. latest version of which the paperback has just come out, mm -hmm. why don't you tell us who you are in your own words? Thank you. Um, yep, so my name is Kojo Karam and I'm a lecturer at the School of Law at Birkbeck and a, also an author of Uncommon Wealth. So we're going to talk about the book and you look at the sort of the traditional current economic indicators, if you like, and there are a lot of red lights flashing, you know, yeah. widening wealth inequality, mm -hmm. stagflation, to name just a few. Uh, you get the impression that Britain is kind of this legacy economy that has, you could call it generational wealth, inherited wealth, but that really the way that a lot of British people conceive of the economy, i.e. up there with the United States and the EU, and I guess China these days, mm -hmm. that feels increasingly misplaced. Mm -hmm. But there's this question of where did that generational inherited wealth come from? So my opening question to you is, where did it come from? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, the short answer will obviously be um, empire, mm -hmm. but I think it's also much more complex than that. And the book was really written in response to the increasing interest in issues of empire that has kind of gripped the nation's consciousness over the past, say, you know, five or six years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Stalin would say the roads must fall movement and then really accelerating with the response to the Black Lives Matter movement, the pulling down of the Colson statue. And I think that in that moment, um, conversations around empire became really the kind of, not just one of the other fronts in the culture war, but also the kind of epicenter of it in a lot of ways, you know, that, you know, empire decolonization, this was what cancel culture, wokeness, you know, all of those kind of issues, snowflakes, were really orientating themselves around. And it became increasingly frivolous, I thought, in the kind of public conversation. And so, you know, you'd have the issue around decolonization 
being focused on not just statues and street names, but TV programs, you know, what songs are sung uh, last night of the proms. And this kind of focus on the cultural and symbolic legacy of empire, I think really missed the main legacy of empire, which was material. You know, this is why people went all around the world in the 16th, 17th and 18th century in order to accumulate and transfer resources across the world. And I thought that this was getting missed in the conversation. You know, of course, there's a cultural element to it. You know, it's important to talk about decolonizing curriculums and, you know, people talking about, you know, are people reading Jane Austen or not? But I was like, this is not what Empire was about. You know, it wasn't about a cultural exchange program. It wasn't about <laughs> sort of people, people going around the world sharing Jane Austen. I love Jane Austen. Mm. But the main purpose of empire was how it orientated the material wealth of the world. And that leads to some of that, both the riches of the United Kingdom, which is the legacy that you pointed to, but also many of the systems that are actually driving the inequality, not just abroad now, but also right here in the UK. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? How, how did that end up manifesting itself? Is it violent wars of conquest? Is it the use of private corporations? What were the kind of means and mechanisms for achieving that transfer of wealth and resource? Well, really all and above. Mm. You know, there's a lot of violent wars of conquest, there's a lot of massacres, there's a lot of famines that people really often focus on when we talk about the legacy of the British Empire. But I think what's perhaps even more important when we look at the kind of cost of living crisis and the kind of the, the, the compounding crises of capitalism that we're facing today is the way in which so much of the British Empire wasn't facilitated through that kind of gun blow diplomacy, but was done by the kind of boring bureaucratic work of private corporations. You know, what really distinguished the British Empire from some of the more state-based European imperial projects like Belgium or France was this use of a conveyor belt of private corporations going from the Hudson Bay Company to the Levant Company, to the Royal Niger Company, to the Africa Lakes Company, and perhaps the most famous of all, the East India Company. Now, why does that history have significance in terms of our world today? I think because we often don't realize that prior to colonialism, the corporate form wasn't something that was inherently commercial. You know, it's something that was often used for um, churches and schools and any kind of institution that wanted to outlast its founders. But through the imperial projects, we start to get the corporate form being a particularly aggressive way of being able to accumulate and expand resources over a period of time. And we also get the protection of many of these corporations by the British state vis-a-vis -vis the interests of people all around the colonies, particularly in the aftermath of decolonization. And so when we look at the world today, where we have all of these essentially unaccountable multinational corporations, that now not only governments in the global south struggle to make, pay their taxes or respect labor regulations or respect environmental regulations, but even governments right here in the global north face those same difficulties, we can see that imbalance, that asymmetry having been produced in the experience and the aftermath of the British Empire. Could you tell me how the British em Empire informs the sort of modern capitalist architecture that surrounds us? Can you kind of trace back the economic system we have now to them? Absolutely. I think in so many ways, you know, the British Empire was the largest empire in human history. And this gives it a particular significance in terms of the development of contemporary capitalism. I mentioned a little bit earlier that it was about the movement of transfer of resources. And that's not just the British Empire, that's all empires from the Songhai Empire to the Mongol Empire. But I think what's significant about the British Empire is the way in which the English common law system became the kind of legal lingua franca of commercial transactions all around the world. And we can see that in the legacy of the international role the London's Commercial Court plays even up until today. We can look at the role of the City of London and the way that it remains even in 2023, really in so many ways, the kind of epicenter of the movement and transfer of assets across the world. And then in terms of some of the more tangible and practical impacts upon the escalating wealth inequality that we struggle with in not just all around the world, but also in the United Kingdom today, we can look at some of the legacies of the British Empire being things like the British overseas territories, like mm. the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, um, Bermuda being, you know, according to the Tax Justice Network anyway, the top three corporate tax havens 
all around um, the world today. We can look at um, very kind of um, recent focuses on issues like the non-DOM tax status that you know seems to benefit an increasingly small proportion of not just the wealthy in the United Kingdom but also our political leaders. Um, you know this th this this tax status, which is an engine of inequality and has you know gained some public notoriety of late with with um, its relationship with the Sunak family. But despite the focus on the non-DOM tax rule. There was very little in the media conversation that emphasized the non-DOM tax status is a hangover of empire. It was established in 1799 to allow people who had property that wasn't resident in the United Kingdom, but in the colonies, to be able to avoid having to pay tax um, following Pitt's um, imposition of the income tax. And so when we want to think about that direct lineage between economic and financial policies that were put into place to protect the movement of wealth in the era of empire and economic and financial policies that protect those who have assets, even in 2023, from having to redistribute them, we can see that connection, I think, quite clearly. Why are so many British overseas territories tax havens? Like, <laughs> what, is, what is the common denominator that causes those things to happen? And I guess a little bit of detail as well about the system of governance for those territories, because I, I think a lot of the British public don't actually realise that there is kind of this this tiered system, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just, oh, they used to be associated with the empire. They're, they're very much the decision making and the power. It does transfer back to Westminster, doesn't it? Absolutely. I think that it's so strange when we often talk about these places as these kind of remote Caribbean, you know, outposts. You know, people are like, oh, you know, all this money's been moved to the Cayman Islands. Like, you know, they're these, you know, tropical paradises yeah, yeah. that only James Bond could go and, you know, get that money back. <laughs> when in reality, these places are British overseas territories, which is really just a fancy word for saying colonies. This is what they are. The modern um, Mexican form. You know what I mean? That the Cayman Islands was wasn't even governed as an independent colony during the era of colonialism. It was part of Jamaica, and it only starts to cultivate its own particular relationship with Westminster following Jamaican independence. And I think that's really telling for how these places become offshore territories. They're offshore because of the shifts on the onshore world. The, basically, what we're talking about is decolonization. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to understand what empire was about. And so if empire was about the movement and transfer of assets across the world, then decolonization was an incredible threat to them. All of a sudden, you had essentially the mass multiplication of democracy. The transfer of so many territories around the world from colonial subjugation into being sovereign nation states themselves, which means that they're able to elect governments that are able to pass laws that might interrupt the flow of capital, whether that be tax laws, whether that be labor laws, whether that be protectionist trade policy. And so in response to that, you get the mass exodus of assets from places like Jamaica or Nigeria or India or Kenya and the other territories of the, of, of, of the British Empire. And they need somewhere to go and safely Hide out, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> and this is what, and this is, and this is where you start to have, um, particularly places like the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands, start to position themselves as jurisdictions that are both inside and outside the United Kingdom. So they are inside the United Kingdom in terms of they give. Um, global asset holders, the confidence of the English legal system, you know, of the expertise, the close connections to the financial experts of the City of London, but they're also outside of, of the United Kingdom in terms of they're not subject to the same pressures of mass democracy, of laborism, and all of the issues that the United Kingdom was wrestling with in that mid 20th century moment. And so this combination allows these places to become um, key nodes in the global network of the transfer of wealth. And this is crucial for understanding some of the wealth inequality that we're wrestling with even right here in the United Kingdom, not just because that they are kind of tax havens, that's a kind of easy um, kind of simplification of, of, of these territories. Um, their, their importance to our economic system isn't just that they allow people who have money to be able to not pay taxes, which obviously leads to less money available for public services and a decreasing living standard of living even here in the United Kingdom. But they also allow important secrecy protections for wealthy individuals, which allows them to purchase assets back in 
places like the United Kingdom through this veil of secrecy. You know, we know that there's over 100,000 properties in the United Kingdom that are purchased through offshore registered companies. This is billions of pounds that's being flooded into the British housing market, and that's creating um, an impossibility for people who are nurses and teachers and firefighters to be able to afford houses in our cities, particularly in London. The decoupling of the world of assets from the world of work and wages, I think, is heavily tied into that aftermath of the British Empire and the emergence of the offshore economy. Yeah, absolutely. And in some instances as well, um, the Privy Council is like the final, the final arbiter of what's right, what's right and wrong. Could you could you talk a little bit about the role of the British Crown for those in those territories as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is another part of the kind of symbolic frivolous debate around the legacy of the British Empire that I think you know captured the public's imagination over the past couple of years you know when Prince William and Kay went to Jamaica and took all those awkward pictures and yeah. people protested them you know there was this assumption that why would people in Jamaica be so mean to poor Wills and Kate, you know, they're, they, you know, they're, they're just sweet kids. This is, it's simply a symbolic role that they play mm. within the, the, the Jamaican constitution, but that ignores some of the very real practical and material consequences of the constitutional position that places like Jamaica and other um, Commonwealth territories that maintain the crown as a head of state um, have to then reckon with. One of which, as you mentioned, is the fact that the highest court in the land of places like Jamaica, and particularly of those overseas territories like the Cayman Islands and the BVI, is the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Now, the Privy Council is one of the most shadowy bodies in the British constitutional network, which most British people will not have even heard about. But if you're in Jamaica and you know, you're unfortunate to find yourself in court and you have to go for appeal and you appeal that, your final chance for justice is a direct appeal to the advisors of the British Crown, you know, of a crown of essentially of, a, of an overseas jurisdiction. It's you know, you can understand why that might create some discomfort for everyday people mm. in a lot of these territories like Jamaica or Barbados, which obviously um, removed the, the monarchy as head of state um, very recently. And so the, the, that kind of architecture of legal and economic control is what I really talk about in Uncommonwealth and try and bring back the conversation around decolonization to the very substantive transfer and distribution of assets around the world, which is what empire and the challenge of decolonization was always all about. It's kind of the, the implication or great assumption in the British constitution, which as we all know isn't written down, right? It's mm -hmm. not codified, yeah. is that basically everyone's gonna be a good sport. Yeah, and yeah. You know, we'll all conduct ourselves fairly. And <laughs> In theory, it works until you end up with someone who's not going to play mm. by the good old, you know, the British spirit of fair play, and yeah. all the, which obviously it, itself is a nonsense. But you, you know, to borrow a recent example, I guess you could look at Boris Johnson and the prorogation of Parliament, mm -hmm. right? and then all of a sudden everyone's kind of scratching their heads, going, well, "Is this constitutionally okay?" And yeah. no one really knows <laughs> because yeah. oh, we don't have it written down and we can't consult it, and really, it's a bit of a guise basically for the powerful to act as they wish. Mm. Isn't it? Or it can be a couple Yeah, of I think it anyway. absolutely can be. You know, it's that yeah, that that good chap theory of um, of, of governance, which um, I think particularly over COVID, we saw you know collapse in on itself as mm. you know the British state kind of became a fulcrum point for the distribution of contracts to friends of you know government ministers that they might have known from boarding school days, and you know that kind of more subtle um, you know chumocracy, as it was called. In the, in the British press, I think is always kind of distinguished from the more substantive, more um, dangerous corruption that we might associate with countries in the global south. And I think that what I try to do also with the Commonwealth is, again, kind of turn that idea on its head and talk about, well, of course, there's huge corruption in terms of state officials in places like Ghana and Nigeria and Kenya, and there's you know huge transfer of, of resources from those territories into offshore accounts um, through the um, uh, light fingers of state officials, but you know they're not keeping it in bank accounts within Kenya and within Nigeria. You know those are ending up in those overseas territories that we mentioned before. And so, if we think about it on a structural level, 
how are, you know, how is this corruption being facilitated? You know, what are the pathways through which people are able to extract wealth from territories around the world? You know, where do they send their kids to school? You know, where do they buy houses? Where do they invest that wealth? And how does that impact the rest of the world? And I think it's difficult to tell that story without looking at the global role that this country has played and think about how much that benefits even everyday people in the United Kingdom today. I guess there's that other node in the network. I'd, I'd like to cycle, but circle back to, to London, if, mm -hmm. if I can now, which is sure. the fin because London is such a financial hub, a lot of these transactions are coming from here. We also have some of the strictest libel laws mm -hmm. in the world, which makes it very appealing for people with a lot of money who want to stop you from talking about them mm -hmm. to send you an expensive lawyer's letter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very expensive and well internationally well regarded private schools for their mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm some of the strongest and most effective PR and reputation management firms as well mm -hmm. that kind of attract the sort of oligarch class, ruling class yeah. to London as, as a basis. I mean, how do you see London connecting to uh, the sort of the system of wealth transfer that we've just been talking about? Well, I think that London plays such a crucial role because, you know, London really was the kind of, you know, sense of coordination for so much of the transfer of wealth around the world during that era of the British Empire. And so, you know, it develops this expertise through um, legal expertise, you know, banking expertise, you know, our, our incredibly successful accountancy industry. And the, the challenge in the aftermath, I think, of decolonization was how much could London maintain control of the capital flows that came from all around the world whilst losing the territorial control that the British Empire allowed for, for, for the British state. And I think that this is where it started to really, you know, sharpen its role in terms of being the place where if you are uh, an oligarch, whether you're from Saudi Arabia, whether you're from Russia, whether you're from India, whether you're from the United Kingdom itself, you know that in London, you have those professionals who are able to facilitate that movement and transfer of wealth. Um, People might want to look at the story of the city of London um, in the aftermath of decolonization, particularly um, the, the Midland Bank um, story, which is known as the kind of birth of the offshore economy. Um, so essentially, this is the kind of moment in which increasing um, regulation around the transfer of wealth around the world coming from the Bread and Woods institutions places more barriers um, from um, kind of you know asset holders in countries, particularly the United States, from being able to move their money around the world, um, you get a, a bank in London, Midland Bank, that are able to circumvent these regulations and allow people who have dollars, particularly people who might not be resident in the U.S., but you know people might be resident in some of the um, you know Soviet-controlled territories, but who want to have their money in in dollars, are more comfortable allowing their, their, their money to be held in a British bank than in a bank in the US or in a bank in their um, actual home jurisdiction. And so what we start to see in the 1950s and leading into the 1960s is this vast buildup of essentially offshore money that became known as euro dollars in London. And this was kind of allowed to blossom with the tantamount you know, acceptance of the Bank of England and the British government. And, you know, you can't tell the story of the transition of the Cayman Islands and the overseas territories into offshore financial centers without talking about London allowing this massive buildup of offshore wealth within the banks of the city of London. Some of the uh, corporations as well, you can trace a direct line, can't you, from that time during empire to now. Could you tell me a little bit about the Anglo-Iranian um, petroleum company? Of course, yeah. So I think that's that's another thing that was getting missed in the debates around decolonization. We were often talking about um, all these incidents, whether it's, you know, transatlantic slavery or, you know, the, some of those massacres and famines we mentioned before, but we were talking about the kind of 17th and 18th century and essentially seeing empire as just, you know, guys in red coats with muskets running around, um, when in reality, you know, the history of decolonization is the 1950s, 1960s, the 1970s. And that conveyor belt of private corporations that I mentioned a little bit earlier runs all the way from the Levant Company in the 16th century to the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company in the 20th century. And so the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company 
for viewers who might not be familiar with, was another one of these kind of um, companies with a with a colonial monopoly. They had the the um, uh, oil refineries in the Abadan region of what was first called Persia and then later known as Iran, and um, they you know had one of the kind of big um, conflicts of that kind of decolonization, third world nationalism, 1950s, 1960s moment when they found themselves in confrontation with a newly elected um, kind of democratic socialist president in Iran, a gentleman called Mohammad Mossadegh. And so Mossadegh wanted to essentially expropriate the properties of the Anglo-Iranian oil company in order to um, fund a essentially a welfare state, you know, funding health and um, you know housing um, education policies um, you know allowing compensation to the company but essentially saying um, Iran as a sovereign state ultimate sovereignty resides with the government and they were using that in order to um, improve the standard of living in that country um, what's really interesting about that moment is the British government at the time the British government at the time of this was the Clement Attlee government, which you know we all know and celebrate for the NHS and building of council houses, and also perhaps more crucially, nationalising huge swathes of the British economy in order to fund that welfare state. And so you might say they would see some um, similarities with what Mossadegh was doing in Iran, but that was not how it went down. Um, to cut a <laughs> to cut a you know a, a long story short. First, there is, you know, an attempt to get a UN Security Council to wage war, that fails. They take Iran to the ICJ, that fails. And eventually, um, Mossadegh is removed through a coup d'etat in collaboration between the United Kingdom and the United States, um, with, um, you know, the United States anti-communist fears being really hyped up by the United Kingdom. Um, why is that significant? for viewers watching in 2023 in the midst of a cost of living crisis in which you know um, escalating energy prices and heating costs are forcing so many people around this country um, to literally choose between heating their home or feeding their children well that's because you know the anglo-iranian oil company like so many of these other colonial companies didn't simply disappear in the aftermath of decolonization, but they did do a bit of a rebrand, you know, uh, a coup d'etat tends to be bad for the share prices. <laughs> so um, in the aftermath, they of course become British Petroleum and then later BP, which, you know, viewers will know, you know, across 2022 have been celebrating record profits um, whilst people have been, you know, struggling with this cost of living crisis. And so I think that that story, like so many others I try and talk about in the book, shows how that that, that, that economic aftermath of the British Empire, I think is so much more impactful and significant in so many people's day-to-day -day lives than even the kind of cultural and symbolic element that we were getting almost obsessed about, I thought, over the past few years. And not to say that's not important, you know, it's, it's important to, you know, not have statues of slave traders, you know, in your town square when you're trying to, you know, go and get a coffee from Prayer Monje. That's, that's a nice thing to not have to deal with, but, I think it was very much in danger of making the entire conversation around empire and decolonization seem like it's irrelevant to people who are struggling with, you know, crumbling public services, you know, insecure um, uh, employment contracts, um, you know, cost of living, um, inability to pay rent or be able to, to buy houses and have some security. And what I tried to do with Uncommonwealth was show that connection between the stagnating and decreasing standard of living that so many people are wrestling with in the United Kingdom and that economic aftermath of the British Empire, like what happened to the Anglo-Iranian oil company and um, its transition into BP. Yeah, I guess uh, Claire Matley was part of the good old chap uh, <laughs> version of Labour prime ministers that mm. at least tried to get a UN resolution before they invaded the Middle East. Um, <laughs> so there's... This, this, this is really interesting, the point you were making, the, the contrast between Mossadegh, right? The, the nationalisation of the industry to pay for the welfare state. And you've uh, recently published a documentary um, on this topic. It's called Boomerang. Um, I'd encourage everyone to watch it. These issues, they, I, sometimes perhaps people conceive of the empire as, as happening in a different place. But the, the politics and the problems, it, it all comes home. Doesn't mm -hmm. it? But there's, yeah. there's, there's an intense and direct connection between the two. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, so, for so long we were 
taught to think about the relationship between Britain and its former empires in terms of a kind of one-way road of development. You know, this idea that, you know, places like Nigeria or like India or like Ghana or like Kenya, um, you know, in those countries you might see huge inequality between the very wealthy and the everyday people. You might see, um, you know, political instability. You might see, um, you know, economic insecurity. But this is all part of the growing pains of these young colonies. And eventually, you know, if they, you know, listen to the lessons that were left by the motherland and, you know, apply a kind of uh, a strict fiscal policy and, you know, listen to the IMF, you know, say their prayers and eat their vegetables, eventually <laughs> they would have, um, you know, a kind of uh, a, a more egalitarian society that, you know, was so um, common in terms of the European social democracy model in, in the kind of mid to late 20th century. And what I'm arguing in terms of the boomerang idea is that I think we're very much seeing the reverse of that. We're actually seeing a lot of the policies that were fired out in the colonies and particularly in the colonies after independence. And so in that moment when all of a sudden there were these governments across all these former territories where companies used to operate without having to worry about the democratic um, force of the local population and now had to wrestle with well, what happens if this particular government expropriates resources, what happens if this particular government increases the tax rate, the counter response to decolonization was sometimes quite crude, like a coup d'etat in Iran, but then eventually becomes more sophisticated in terms of structural adjustment programs, in terms of odious debt, um, in terms of conditional loan agreements, in terms of the offshoring of wealth. And these tactics essentially to protect the movement of assets around the world from the threat of decolonization is for me starting to have an impact right here in the former heart of the biggest empire the world has ever seen. And this is what I mean by the boomerang. The structural adjustment programs that you will have saw in the global south and the former colonies in the 1980s and 1990s start to look a very, you know, start to look a lot like austerity policies that are now being implemented right here in the United Kingdom. You know, the offshoring of wealth used to be a problem for these former colonies in the global south, you know, capital flight. Now it's something that we're wrestling with and struggling with right here in the United Kingdom. And I think that that changes the importance for us in the United Kingdom of knowing about the history of empire and around the history of decolonization. I think there was again a danger with the more kind of identity politics, um, you know, um, kind of cultural perspective on the imperial question of perhaps saying to people that, you know, it's important to learn about empire, you know, because it'll show you're a good person. It'll show that you care about, you know, poor, um, you know, struggling people, you know, in the global south and Africa and Asia, Latin America, etc. Whilst that's very much not what I'm saying in the Commonwealth, it's very much saying it's important to learn about the history of empire because then you can learn about the tactics of capital accumulation that are going to be tried out over there and eventually imposed right here as well. How then, in your view, does empire inform modern identity? Without going into, into identity politics, what do you think the relationship between the two is? I think that, you know, there's, a, of course, a great significance in terms of the cultural, the identity, the kind of racial aspect of empire, you know, that's not what I'm completely dismissing. Um, I, but I feel that it's part of the kind of decoration of empire. And it's all in the service of the ultimate driver of empire, which I said was material. And so, of course, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a racial legacy in terms of the kind of hierarchy of humanity that was produced through the imperial project, this idea that, you know, certain people, uh, certain levels, you know, we think of those kind of 19th century um, eugenicist, scientific racist charts of, of, of people across the world. And, you know, that has a real tangible legacy in terms of odious racial politics today. But that wasn't the fundamental motivation of the imperial endeavor. Like I mentioned before, you know, people did not get on ships in the 18th century and sail halfway across the ocean just so they could racially abuse someone and then get on the ships and come back. Like the purpose is to reduce particular populations to categories of being subhuman, which therefore means that their claim over their property is now null and void. This is now terra nullius. No one is here, therefore you're able to accumulate those resources on the land. Contracts signed with um, you know, native representatives don't have to be respected because they're not human. That dehumanization has a material purpose at the end of it. And I think that that connection between the kind of cultural and identity element 
of the Imperial Project and the ultimate driver of it in terms of constructing a world in which resources could be moved around with ease has got lost a little bit. And I think that is what I'm trying to, trying to bring back to the conversation. How uh, central in your view was, is the Imperial Project to the actual formation of Britain? And by that I mean sort of the Union of Britain, sort of 1707, the Act of Union. Yeah. Well, I think the one thing that we often ignore is how long the empire has been going on for. And so I say in the Commonwealth, um, you know, we usually throw around this idea that kind of Britain had an empire. I've probably said it already in this interview. Um, it rolls off the tongue. But in terms of the actual historical specificity, it'd be more accurate to say that the empire had Britain in terms of the actual unification between Scotland and England it's not just preceded by England already being a colonial entity. You know, the relationship between England and Barbados goes back to the 1620s. England and Jamaica goes back to the 1670s. This precedes the Act of the Union by decades. But more importantly, and we can see this if we read, you know, many of the 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 the, the great kind of Scottish um, literary figures of, of that time, people like Robert Burns, they're very clear that they see the motivation for the Scottish nobles for actually agreeing to the union in the first place is being tempted by the profits that are on offer by England's more successful imperial project. You know, Scotland as well had an imperial project itself, which was, wasn't was very successful, you know, New Caledonia and, you know, now what is modern day Panama. And so the potential of private wealth being accumulated through this global imperial project has a lot to do with the, you know, the foundational union that is at the heart of the uh, of, of the United Kingdom. And you know, people like the the great Scottish academic and intellectual who, who sadly just passed away, Tom Nairn, um, you know, wrote kind of explicitly in his book *The Breakout of Britain*. This is back in the late 70s, and you know, right on all the way in the 80s and 90s. You know, Nairn sees the the imperial project is the kind of anchor of the British state and anticipated that once that project was removed, we'd start to see increasing fragmentation and breaking apart of the British state project. And, you know, maybe a couple of decades later than he anticipated, but I think we're starting to see that if we look at British politics, um, you know, in 2023. And so I don't think that that's inevitable. I think that that's an opportunity for maybe rethinking, well, what is Britain? What can Britain be outside of this easy synthesis with this global imperial project? Over the course of this conversation, there's been uh, quite a motley cast of characters, the, the royal family, um, the lawyers and bankers in the city of London, and the subjugated masses, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, wh where, do you, where do you see power sitting in, in modern Britain? Is it any of the people we've just discussed, or is it some, somewhere else that we, we haven't got to yet? I do think that there's been an increasing awareness of the extent to which politics in Britain has been monopolized by a particularly small cohort and its, you know, intimate relationship with those structures of essentially protecting the financial flows, the, the capital flows of the aftermath of empire, you know, that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, you know, in terms of the characters in Uncommonwealth, I think one of the most significant ones um, that I think really speaks to where power sits in Britain, you know, in the aftermath of empire is, is Enoch Powell. Um, so, you know, people might be familiar with Powell just through his kind of nativist and racist politics and, of course, the rivers of blood speech, and they might associate him with, you know, a, a particularly marginal group of kind of far-right British politicians like Oswald Mosley and Nick Griffin and, you know, whoever. But, um, you know, Powell was way more influential than any of those people I just associated him with. You know, he was a minister in multiple governments, you know, he was constantly cited as a, as a prime minister to be. And then ideologically, um, people often just focus on his anti-immigration politics, but if you look at his economic politics, he was very much in many ways the kind of John the Baptist to Margaret Thatcher. Um, you know, he kind of cleared the pathway in terms of being the first politician in post-war Britain to call for privatization, to call for deregulation, to call for a, a cut in taxes. You know, I, in, in the book I include this story, which I think is always gets ignored when we talk about the rivers of blood speech. So in 68, he goes to Birmingham, gives the famous Rivers of Blood speech, you know, essentially telling, you know, white working class people, you know, be afraid, 
there's all these black and brown hordes who are going to come and kill you. And this is, you know, what we know Powell for. Only a few months later, he's at the Mont Pelerin Society, you know, Friedrich Hayek's um, think tank of, you know, economic masterminds that really implement a neoliberalism around the world. And Powell is seen by them as their kind of great hope in England, as Hayek says. And he's talking at the Mont Pelerin Society about the removal of a fixed exchange rate and the removal of capital controls, essentially creating a world of free flowing assets. Um, and so I think that those are the two sides of power that we often forget. That on one hand, he's telling people, working people in Britain, you know, I'm your great defender. And then a few months later, he's telling, um, you know, a, a, a very elite cohort, these are the systems that we need to put into place to protect the world of assets from the world of everyday people. Those very same people he thought he was protecting, he knows he's advocating policies of the Mont Pelin Society that are going to leave them impoverished within a generation or so. And so that kind of, um, you know, showing one hand and hiding the other hand dynamic, I think is very much how politics and power has been operating in Britain, you know, ever since. And I think we're seeing that very much in the, um, you know, the kind of culture war response at the same time as the United Kingdom is, is suffering a financial crisis. You know, it's that same politics of power of, you know, implementing um, systems and structures that are going to lead to stagnating, if not decreasing, living standards for everyday people in Britain, you know, across decades and generations while saying the great threat that you have to worry about is immigrants, it's refugees on boats, it's, you know, it's the other. Um, so that's, I think, how a lot of politics has sustained itself in the United Kingdom. But I think once you start to look at the history of empire and you look at figures like Powell, that, that, that um, contrast starts to collapse in on itself. Such a revealing example because he's doing the two in such close proximity to each mm -hmm. other. But, you know, you talking about him as in the context of that think tank who reminds me of Liz Truss and the Institute for Economic Affairs. Mm -hmm. I think they described, they described her as like, as Britain is like their laboratory or something yeah, in the aftermath absolutely. After, after she got out there. Yeah. And, and the IEA is an institution that was, I'm sorry to say, championed and mainstreamed by Enoch Powell. You know, he was the first politician to write for them. You know, at the time that they were a marginal think tank, he's working with Ralph Harris, working with Arthur Seldon, working with a lot of the founders of, um, you know, An Anthony Fisher's Institute of Economic Affairs. And so that lineage between Powell and, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, ideological cohort that brought Liz Trust into power, I think is something that's at least worth tracing. And then on the other hand, you have the likes of Sue Ella Brahman gleefully laughing and smiling in front of accommodation that's being built for uh, migrants to Britain in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You have Lee Anderson saying the quiet part loud in an interview, mm -hmm. being like, you know, we don't have much of a campaign, so it's gonna have to be the culture war and trans stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was so extraordinary that he, he just said it out loud. It was almost mm -hmm. like, Normally, they kind of at least try to sort of put a face on it and pretend that's not what they're doing. It's a bit more subtle. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it feels even, even more brazen uh, Absolutely, yeah. these days than perhaps, it, well, maybe not actually. When you're <laughs> rivers of blood, actually. I don't know, that's, that's a valid comparison. But yeah, you have, on the one hand, you have the sort of economic hard right yeah. combined with the, the culture war, the othering, the demonization of other people. Mm. And... Um, it serves to undermine that sort of collective class consciousness, doesn't it, between between the working class? Absolutely. I think that there's just there's there's no answers to the kind of real acute problems that people are facing in the United Kingdom at the moment, and so they are resorting to these more frivolous culture war um, uh, modes of rhetoric because it's difficult to explain to people why is there this escalating gap between the value of work, the value of the wages they received, and the ability to, 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 to be able to purchase assets, to be able to purchase security, to be able to have a decent standard of living. You know, why is there, um, you know, more money that they seem to be paying in, um, you know, their contributions, um, whilst at the same time their public services are, are, are decreasing and being devalued year upon year. You know, these are structural global problems that have deep histories and that's very difficult to wrestle with without confronting real entrenched power. And that's something that it doesn't seem like too many politicians in the United Kingdom are happy to do at the moment, so it's much easier to just blame refugees. Kodo Karam, it's a rather depressing place to leave <laughs> it, but I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us. It's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, Uncommonwealth is out now in paperback. Uh, do go and get it. Thank you so much. For thank you for having time. me. Cheers.